that there are mentally ill people in long-term segregation and others who begin the step-down program but are sent back to the beginning repeatedly for allegedly minor infractions. We hear about prisoners at Red Onion who are classified as too dangerous to ever transition out of segregation, even though they have not had any disciplinary infractions in years. We hear about alleged assaults by guards and abuse of use of restraints and canine units, as well as ongoing use of administrative segregation, which is separate from long-term segregation and is not affected by the step-down program. And so I'm wondering, um, and I'd like to hear from anybody who, who wishes to address the question, um, what action do you think can be taken to objectively establish the truth of what is really happening in these prisons? And what can you as legislators do to help us and how can we work together on this? Thank you. Pat, why you I mean, thank, thank you for the question. I mean, I've been following this issue. I get those same letters that you get. I think a lot of us get those kinds of letters too. Uh, I know that the, part, the uh, U.S. Department of Justice has recently, recently issued a report that cites Virginia as, as one of the five states that have made a dramatic decrease in the number of people that are in segregation. When I first became involved in this issue in 2011, we had it was over 400 people at Red Onion that were in segregation. That's been reduced by 71 percent. Uh, there are, as you mentioned, there are some people that are still there. Uh, there are, there have, since they've started this step-down program, about 15 people have returned back. Some people are in segregation for, for their own protection. And you think of uh, Lee Malvo is, is in there at Red Onion. He's, he's in there for his own protection. If he were out in the general population, he would be killed. There's other people that they have there that, that they would tell you are in segregation for their own safety. And there are other people that are in there for other reasons that they just can't work well with others, I guess. And so I, I think it's, I, I think what we've, we've heard from an objective source that there is a lot of progress, a lot of progress being made there, not just Red Onion, but also Wallens Ridge. For those that are <coughs> remaining, look, I think it's really important. This is not the law. I tried to bring a bill in that would make it the law. Jim, Jim Lemonian supported that effort. And um, it was it was uh, defeated, but we worked administratively, and I think we have a, a very enlightened, not just previous governor, but also the current governor, and our terrific uh, director of the Department of Corrections that has made this a priority. Either one of those situations could change, and you could revert just as quickly as you did over the last few years back to where it once was, because I think that there is probably a push to, to, to do that within the system. So I just think that we need to be vigilant and stay on top of that. But I think, I'm confident that it's had some objective parties that have looked at what Virginia is doing and said it's doing a very good job in what it is doing. Are there problems? Is it perfect? No. But they've made significant progress, and I think that we need to work with them for those that are still there to see what we can do to get people out of the system, out of segregation, and into the general population. If it's, it's gotta be safe for the inmates, the other inmates, it's gotta be safe for correctional officers. If I may also add uh, to that, um, that's all very positive, but one of the problems that you have within corrections is that there are not enough people like you and other members of this audience that brings this to the general population's attention. Uh, because again, as I said, there's no constituency for those, for the inmates that are there that are effective politically. Uh, looking at the Senate study, it was not a joint study, of conditions within corrections, you see the problem of, of much too much overtime so that you have guards that are not, uh, who are under particular stress and so some of these incidents uh, get reported and get treated inappropriately. Uh, that overtime issue is a very serious issue, which again, from experience, we tried to bring under control for those very security reasons that are there. You see in that Senate report also a lot of issues having to deal with the culture within certain of the institutions where uh, those who are on the, uh, on the, in the cell blocks, uh, on, in their guard posts, uh, are counsel to do other than what their training would have had them do besides the issue of not having 
adequate ongoing recruitment so that you have adequate training which is really reflective of what the inmate uh, uh, control needs to be within a constructive uh, framework rather than a purely authoritarian harsh a framework. I'd like to suggest that your work group we arrange to meet with Delegate Hope later on and then <coughs> build a, pool all the information we can on that and, and see where it leads us and what next, some possible next steps uh, and then uh, to reach out to other legislators who are interested in working on some solutions. So does that mean, yeah, uh, Delegate Hope said yeah. Uh, Jerry, what's your question? Yeah, thank I'm, I'm Jerry Poggi. I'm wearing a hat today as the vice chair of the Human Services Council for Fairfax County. We just presented our budget recommendations to the boards of supervisors on Friday. And one of the more serious recommendations, which is a deep structural one, it's one that's related in the front page of the Washington Post today. I hope everybody understands the economic and demographic transition occurring within the cash cow for the state as a whole, Fairfax County, we have a, a deep problem in 31,000 affordable dwelling units being short in our county. It's not a problem that can be solved in this year's county budget or next year's or the years after, and it can't be solved without a stronger, deeper partnership and vision at the state level. So maybe to Delegate Bulova, since you were so happy to raise this uh, in your time, you also are connected perhaps to people on the boards of supervisors that could be influential. We need to think about how do we solve what will be a most important economic development program for the county. The Deputy County Executive has raised this through his deep study into what's the future for the county. And it has to begin with addressing the housing crisis that we're in. A new school teacher making $50,000 a year cannot afford to live in the county where we're expecting them to solve the school problems. It affects seniors, it affects those with mental health issues, it affects those with disabilities. So we need to be mobilized this year to meet the challenge of wannabe governors, lieutenant governors, attorney generals, to say, unless you're coming forward with a progressive, long-term solution to this deep problem, you shouldn't be in that office. And you know, I think we need to reconstitute the legislature to be seeing why that this very important economic development issue gets solved. We got um, $8 million to address this issue uh, a few years ago when we created the Affordable Housing Trust Fund in Virginia. It was built on the work of Mary Margaret Whipple and uh, um, I was able to get that passed my, uh, when I was a freshman. Here's the issue. Our $8 million is a pittance compared to what, say, California has or Illinois has or Massachusetts has or Maryland has. Um, when, you know, California's got $1.69 billion with a B in their Affordable Housing Trust Fund and we have $8 million. Well, this year we actually increased the funding, working with Republicans, especially Chris Jones, the chair of appropriations in the House, and actually Janet Howell on the Senate side, we're able to increase the money from $8 million to $11 million, so 5.5 in each year, by each year of the biennial budget, which will actually help thousands more people in Virginia, but it's still a drop in the bucket. That's maybe two major public housing, public-private ventures that builds affordable housing in the state. We're talking about multi, multi millions of right, dollars. Right, right. Well, so I, I, I celebrate your work. Well, what we, our original request was for $20 million in each year of the Bonneville budget. All right, we asked for the stars and got the moon. The fact is, we need to continue asking for the stars and, and actually, you know, uh, and getting a little bit more every year. And eventually, we will get there. But the fact okay. is that we're beginning to create a, a positive dialogue on both sides. Thank, thank you for your message, Jerry. Um, 